can you see my screen? I'm presuming yes, if nobody's uh, saying. So I thought that I would start by one of the, let me see if I can move forward. Here. We can see I have it. No dis yeah. yeah, I have no disclosure, except that really oftentimes I feel things are not going fast, fast enough. We went from the ice age to the stone age in pediatric brain tumors with the new molecular that we've gained. And I'm really hoping for this time where we are like uh, going fast as light and it's starting, it's starting so many things happening despite COVID, despite everything. And I'm going to share some of the new things that we have on Histo. Every story has a beginning and this beginning started for, for me in 2011, published in 2012, where at the same time then Susie Baker's group at St. Jude, who identified histone mutation at the core of those pediatric glioma. I always bring this slide because I think it's self-telling. It tells me that this, those tumors are really a different way of cancer. And this is what I'm going to try and convey, convey throughout this lecture, lecture is that even though cancer is one name, there are many ways to achieve it. And in this case, it's really development gone wrong. And why do I think that? Is because at the very beginning, when we identified those histone mutations, there was this specific spatiotemporal uh, effect that we saw. If you are five to seven years old, I'm sorry, three to five years old, you would have a tumor in the pons that we would call a DIPG, and you'll hear more through Mariella and Michelle about this and you'll find the histone 3.1 K27M mutation. And it had the best partner in crime is ACVR1, which is a kinase that really is involved in left-right patterning and has nothing to do in the palms. Usually it should not be expressed, but is being co-opted by this mutation. Five to seven year old, still in the palms, still the IPG. This time it's K27M and a histone variant that histone 3.3 non-canonical, always associated with CP53 or PPM1D mutations. 7 to 11 now in the thalamus, and you have histone 3.3 K27M, mainly associated with this TP53, but in some instances with FGFR1 point mutation, the same one that you identify in the lower grade on their own. And FGFR is very important for the uh, diencephalon uh, development and is being co opted in this case scenario for, by K27M. Slightly older, this time between 13 to 35 years old. This time it's gonna be in your forebrain. And more interestingly, in your temporal parietal and slightly in the frontal forebrain, really exquisitely in those areas, where you have the R to V G34 mutation exquisitely in histone 3.3. And they're always associated with CP53 and with ATRX mutation. And a little bit older, and this weren't our finding, were the finding of the TCGA, uh, uh, the tumor atlas group. The IDH mutation associated with CP53 that are mainly and predominantly in the frontal lobe. And we identified loss of function CD2 mutation in the, uh, uh, in the forebrain that are also associated with TP53 and ATRX. And why do I bring that? Because if we think about it really, your midline, which is your spine, your pons, your thalamus, and hypothalamus are a story of a K27M mutation, either in histone 3.3 or in histone 3.1. And your cortex is a problem in reading a lysine 36 on a histone 3 tail, whether it's SED2, which mediates the trimethylation of lysine 36 uh, in, in, uh, in humans, and IDH or G34 that indirectly would affect the uh, reading or the methylation of this lysine residue. So for me, just based on the spatial temporal way that those mutations are rising and what they have, this is a problem in development and development gone wrong. And what we're really being pushing forward that pediatric and young adults are a story of two lysine on the histone 3 variant that has gone wrong, lysine 27 and lysine 36. And I put on the side all of the papers, the initial paper that, that led us to this hypothesis. So we spoke about midline high grade gliom and K27M, there are other brain tumors that really share this love for this lysine 27 on a histone 3 tail. And those are the group posterior A, group, uh, the posterior fossa group A ependymomas that have either now we know overexpression of EZIP, and I'll come to that, and in rare instances, uh, K27M mutations. The group three and four medulloblastoma, how come? Because they have truncating mutation in KD, KDM6A, and KDM6A is what K27 
tri uh, trimet or demethylate lysine 27, so honing in on that, or they have overexpression or PRC2 signature and EZH2 is the enzyme that methylates lysine 27. And the ATRTs that also for some subgroup have a PRC2 signature. So really the lysine 27 and this histone uh, three variants have a really a pivotal role for me in the genesis of those brain tumors. So if you look at them, those histone three variants, they have, uh, they were initially identified in those brain tumors. Another, and what we've, what I've shown you is what they have in, in those brain tumors. The posterior fossa ependymoma, you have the K27M in two to five percent, and this is work from the group of uh, Marcel Kuhl that initially identified them, but that was validated by other groups. We identified in two percent of leukemias in AML and mainly in action uh, myelodysplastic syndrome K27M mutation. So we are extending the spectrum of those oncohistones. The group of uh, uh, Adrian Flanagan and Peter Campbell at Oxford identified in chondroblastoma a mutation in lysine 36 itself. And like K27M is a lysine 36 to a methionine substitution. And they identified a glycine 34W, very rarely an arginine and or leucine in the hind cell tumor of the bone, which also extend the spectrum of those oncohistones. And we identified in undifferentiated sarcomas, 20% uh, lysine 36 m mutation. And for a pediatrician in head and neck cancer, about 15% of the TP53, uh, of the HPV negative TP53 mutant uh, squamous cell uh, head and neck carcinoma have a problem, either a K36M or an NSD1 mutation, and I'll come to that, that hones in on those, this lysine being disrupted and at the origin of those cancer. So just to say that oncohistone, even though they were initially identified in, in brain tumor, they really largely extend beyond, and either directly by those oncohistone or indirectly by the writer raisers or readers are affecting those cancer, and this is something that we can target, as I will show you. So it's a new paradigm. It's really something that's needed almost like a, a rosette stone to be uh, uncovered and to understand how they are mediating uh, oncogenesis. We're, start, we're still far from understanding everything, but I think in the last seven years, and it took us time, we've went a long way into, in doing that, and I'll share some of what we have. So two residues in gliomas, a lysine 27 changed to methionine, rarely to an isoleucine, and a glycine 34 changed to an arginine or a valine. Histone 3 variants are the most conserved protein in evolution. Even plants have them. And really, as humans, we've evolved to have seven different variants, which tells us that these are important to us. What do they do? Histones are the core component of nucleosomes. And nucleosomes are what wraps our DNA. So we have an octamer, dimer of histone 3 variants with histone 4, H2A with H2B, and around it you have. 147 base pair of DNA that really goes and uh, one of the major role of those nucleosomes is to pack our DNA. From 2 meter 10, we pack it into something invisible that fits within the nucleus. But you agree with me that you need to express it. You need to express your DNA and your genetic information for genes to be transcribed for all of what we need in order to gather our phenotype to happen. And this is what also those histones that pack our compact our DNA, open it and do it. And we've evolved to have a very complicated system where within those histones, and really I'm touching the bare surface for just for the sake of not losing you, what we have is on this histone three tail, we can put a mark, something writes it, there's an enzyme, something remove it because we don't want it to be there forever, and something reads it to act on it. And unfortunately, there are so many, I used to work in signal transduction, and this is even more complicated than that. There are so many things. You could put an acetylation, a methylation, a mono, a di, or a trimethylation mark, different enzyme for each step of these. And they have, there's a hierarchy between the different lysines, phosphorylation, ubiquitination, croton relation, serotonin relation, and there are more that are coming. So just imagine the way that we can play with the epigenome. And the message here, and I keep saying that, 
is what we do. The DNA is the same, the sequence is the same in every single cell that we have. Our cells behave differently, and this is because the epigenome is telling them what to do, when to open, when to close, what to express, what not to express. And think about it like notes of music that are meaningless until, unless they are put in a partition. And the epigenome is what, given, what gives the partition to our DNA, what makes the music sound what it needs to sound when it needs to sound. It's actually the barcode. And this barcode is completely wrong in this case of our human gliomas. The lysine 27, I hope you could see my pointer, get monodye and trimethylated by the PRC2 complex. It's made of EZH1 and EZH2, which is the enzyme that catalyzes all three, uh, uh, all three steps of methylation. The lysine 36 gets also monodye and trimethylated by, by different enzymes. ZD2 is the only trimethyl transferase for lysine 36, and NSD1 and 2 mediate mono but mainly dimethylation. And you have other things that remove those uh, enzymes. And the reason I bring that, when K27 is trimethylated, it's the most repressive mark that you could have. Whether it's on a gene or in the intergenome, whenever it lands, it will recruit the PRC1 complex and mediate gene silencing and then compaction of your chromatin if it's an intergenic region. The lysine 36 methylation has been always thought to be an active mark. The dimethylation is across the intergenome and in some area. The trimethylation is mainly in gene bodies, and now we know a little bit in enhancer, and it's associated with active chromatin, with open chromatin. Almost a yin yang. The lysine 27 trimethylated, closing the epigenome, closing the genome. The lysine 36, more of an active mark. And both of these are not, they never live, they never coexist. On the, same nucle uh, on the same histone three tail. So when one is affected, as I will show you, the other one will also be affected inversely, almost like a pendulum. So the lysine 27 also gets acetylated, and this is the major activating mark that recruits, is, uh, that's actually a signature of open chromatin. And when you have a lysine 27 that's acetylated, you can't have a methylation on the other nucleus. So first, after having said that, what do the K2M substitution in histone 3? Remember I said the K27 changed to methionine, the lysine 36 changed also to methionine. What are those K2M do? The first clue came from the beautiful work of uh, uh, Peter Lewis in the lab of Dave Ellis at that time, where he showed that any time you had lysine change to methionine, whether on lysine 4, lysine 9, lysine 27, lysine 36, you had a drastic decrease, if not an, it's not abolished, it's drastically decrease of the methylation mark. And actually what he showed is that this met methionine, which is a monobranch amino acid, is inhibiting the uh, metal transferase domain, the set domain within those metal transferases. The best pharmacological inhibitor and it's preventing those metal transferases from correctly depositing the metal mark on those residues. Okay, great. What does it do? We tried initially to work on K27M, but it was too complicated based on the added mutation. So we went for the lysine 36 m that's found in chondroblastoma, and this is the only mutation. And this was also work done uh, by in the Alice lab, and where I really uh, collaborated with Peter Lewis Dave Alice and Chao Lu spearheaded, uh, he has now his own lab in Colombia, spearheaded this work. We overexpressed the lysine 36 mutation uh, in mesenchymal progenitor cells because those were the suspected cell of origin of those chondroblastoma and the undifferentiated sarcoma that we identified. And when we put this mutation, what happened, if you push those mesenchymal progenitor into differentiation, you could no longer, longer get any adipocyte, any chondrocyte, any osteoblast. So the simple fact of putting this mutation in a mesenchymal progenitor blocked differentiation. And more interestingly, it promoted tumor formation. And when we looked at the effect on the epigenome of this overexpression, this is showing the wild type in, uh, and those are three marks that we studied, the K27 trimethylation, which is here in red, the lysine 36 dimethylation, which is in turquoise and blue, 
and the lysine 36 trimethylation in wild type. As expected in gene body, you have beautiful peak of lysine 36 tri. In the intergenome, this is a really super abundant mark, a large areas of lysine 36 dye, and you have uh, the K27 tri. Anything that you want to silence, like the call for A3 gene is silenced by K27 trimethylation. There was nothing on the transcriptome. The RHBDO is paced with lysine 36 tri and would be highly expressed, and you would have a little bit of lysine 36 dye. When we put the mutation, as expected, you inhibit, you drastically decrease the level of tri and dimethylation lysine 36, as we show here. What happened to the lysine 27 tri? What we saw initially, while those lysine 27 tri was stopped by boundaries of lysine 36 di or tri, it had no more boundary and was able to actually go and deposit the mark throughout a lot of intergenic region, silencing this gene here that was active. And actually, there's something more complicated than that's happening here. If we think that the aim of lysine 27 tri is to recruit PRC1, the effect should be seen on PRC1. So what we did, we went and looked at PRC1 recruitment in either lysine 36 m and in wild type. Ring 1B is one of the core, and CBX2 are one of the core components of canonical PRC1. And what we show exquisitely here is that if you look at the level of lysine 36 tri, 27 tri in K36M, even though in the intergenome they had increased because they migrated, if you looked compared to the wild type, in those genic area, they are decreased. They are not, PRC2 is not, it's almost as you're diluting the PRC1, PRC2 message. And what happens is that while you had beautiful peaks in the wild type where you're recruiting PRC1 and silencing those Hox genes here, you had, a, you lose those peaks and you lose those repression and you had expression of genes that should not be expressed. So just to recap, and I'll show you things. In this case scenario, the lysine 27 tri was increased in the intergenome and decreased in some genic areas, which led actually to redistribution of PRC1. And I'm gonna show you that. So usually you have a gene, in a gene area, you have trimethylation of lysine 27 that recruit PRC1, and your gene is silenced. In the intergenome, you have a crosstalk between areas that are active that are based with lysine 36 dye, a mark that's deposited by NSD1 and NSD2, and the areas that have K27ME3 that recruit PRC1 and that are silenced. And this leads to have a normal epigenome. And if you're a mesenchymal stem cell, you're allowed to differentiate into a chondrocyte or to anything. K36M happens. K36M inhibit NSD1 and NSD2 and prevent them from depositing the needed amount of lysine 36 dye. What happened then is that your K27 tri is able to spread more into intergenic region and less, there is less K27 tri in some of the genic regions and your PRC1 gets diluted. You don't have, it's, everything is dose dependent. You don't have more PRC1 being produced and it's already probably a saturating level in those cells and your PRC1 has way more target that it can go into, and you dilute repression, and you dilute it where it matters more, in the areas that mediate differentiation, and you obtain a blockade in differentiation. And this is what leads to those chondro chondroblastomas and to the sarcomas. If that's true, anything that has a mutation in SZ1, and potentially in SZ2, should be a problem. And this is how we uncovered the head and neck cancer story. We looked and there was a paper that was put in the TC by the TCJ group that showed that in a percentage of, of tumor, you had truncating loss of function mutation in SD1. Went and downloaded the DNA methylation data from the TCGA and did unsupervised clustering. And we had this exquisitely, this beautiful cluster here that is made of NSD1 mutant and the tumors that didn't have the NSD1 mutation had lysine 36 m Multiple different genes, because there are about 30 genes that encode for histone 3 variant, but the same amino acid substitution and the same effect, inhibiting NSD1. And actually, this is what, what's driving in, uh, the, the, muta the mutation, the, the, the tumor phenotype. All of this, 15%, 
we had we uh, we validated that by immunohistochemistry. This is uh, a, an antibody that specifically recognized lysine 36M. You see here in the tumor, all of the cells have the lysine 36M. They don't express lysine 36 di but they have a drastic decrease in lysine 36 di and lysine 36 tri. The NSD1 mutant has a have a drastic decrease in the lysine 36 di and the wild type are have nothing in this. Why is that important? Because there are two things. If you look at the survival of those patients that had a neck cancer, the one that had the K36M had a better survival. Why is that? They had a higher mutation rate. And when we looked further, they were globally super DNA hypermethylated. Really, one of the things, and I'm not putting that, that led Chow to have a beautiful publication in Nature where he showed that the lysine 36 dye actually recruit DNA T3A which deposit then a DNA methylation mark across this. And the fact that you had the loss of lysine 36 dye in this prevented you from recruiting another repressive mark that could be repressive in the intergenome with DNA methylation. And you had way more, and I'll show that some to this uh, uh, mutation rate in those tumors, and you had higher expression of endogenous retroviruses, a level of viral mimicry, that made it a little bit more immune prone to those tumors. And this may be something that you could push forward and he's pursuing that as we go. So what about K27M? What's happening here? There was, as I showed you, the first work that showed that you have a huge decrease in the level of trimethylation. If you look at this immunohistochemistry, this is a wild type DIPG that has no K27M mutation, and this is a staining by immunohistochemistry for K27ME3. And you see here the beautiful loss, except around blood vessel, of K27ME3. It's misleading. It's not a loss, because if you look at the chromatin, despite the fact that you have drastic decrease across the board of the level of lysine 27 tri, there are areas like the one that I'm showing here that have beautiful, even seemingly increased K27 tri methylation, despite the presence of K27M. And the fact this led people to say, maybe it's not inhibiting PRC2. Let's look what's happening here. So if you think that your intergenome is 98% of your genome and 2% are estrogenic area, if you think that the K27ME3 is really pasting huge area that extend beyond the gene area, and those areas now, because of K27M, are devoid of this repressive mark. Is it really empty as the immunohistochemistry would really have us think so? No. Look what's happening here. First, hypothesis came that potentially when you have a mutant nucleosome on your uh, chromatin, what you would do is you recruit the PRC2 complex. And because of higher affinity, it's just stuck there. And this is why you have this increase in some region of this mark. The, K, the PRC2 is recruited to area that are enriched for this mutation and really cannot go beyond that. This is one hypothesis, the sequestration hypothesis. There was another hypothesis that was provided by the group of Christian Helen that, so, that spoke about the higher affinity. PRC2 lands in areas based on its affinity. There are areas that have way higher affinity for PRC2 than other areas. And those are, for example, CPG island or some specific gene like the CDKN2A P16 that are really very, and the Hox gene that are, represent super high affinity area for PRC2 to come and to deposit the K27 trimethyl mark because you need to start somewhere. And the idea of uh, Christian Helen is that the area that had higher affinity were better able to maintain this repressive mark Whereas, whereas the area that had lower affinity lost it. And he thought that, you know, you recruited it unduly to areas of high affinity just because PRC2 couldn't go to other areas of K27M. And he made that suggestion is that if you actually use PRC2 inhibitor, then you would remove from the CGIs and the P16, uh, the, uh, the K27 trimethylation, and this would lead to cell deaths. So this is another hypothesis. The last hypothesis was made by the group of uh, Alishi Latifar, 
where they showed that you had actually a dual nucleosome. One, remember in the nucleosome, you have two histone three variants. One would have the mutation in that case scenario. And because the other one couldn't get trimethylated because those two marks are mutually exclusive, the other one would get acetylated. And those heterotopic nucleosome were uh, really not, uh, would repulse the PRC2 complex that would land elsewhere in the genome, like shown here. Here is a chip seek for K27M, and you don't see any, uh, any SUSI, uh, uh, where when you have a PRC2 recruitment, it's not enriched for K27M. And the reverse is true. When you have K27M, you have acetylation, you recruit BRD4, you have a new enhanced promoter landscape that is oncogenic. You're really shifting the cell identity and making it oncogenic. All of this beautiful hypothesis, but made in overexpression model and not in the lineage of origin. So this is what we did. We went and uh, designed in primary cell line obtained from patients. We CRISPRed out the mutation. And we did, if I tell you, I don't know how many CRISPR clone and unedited clone for each given cell line and not one cell line, probably six or seven different cell line to the same effect. And this is what we obtained. And this work was co-led by Jacek Majewski, really a long-standing collaborator, and by Ashot, who is a postdoc in my lab, and Brian, who is a graduate student in my lab, who is Haifen Chen, who is supervised by Jacek and a postdoc in Jacek's lab. So what we showed exquisitely is that you don't have a sequestration. You don't have a shift to stronger affinity sites of PRC2, and you don't have the repulse. PRC2 lands where it needs to land and can spread up to a point within a given cell cycle. This is showing anything that's red is a K27M mutant. Anything that's blue is a CRISPR. Is this, in this case scenario, is a wild-type clone. You see that actually the K27ME3 is landing here, but look for the K27ME2. The K27ME2 is deposited by EZH2. It can go beyond, it's not sequestered. This is really around a large area of the epigenome. It can go and work, it's not being sequestered. And we had no new landing site. And when we removed the mutation, you were able to shift it to have the mark being redeposited. We didn't have new areas being deposited, just the mark being able to spread from the initial landing site of PRC2. So what we think is happening, PRC2 is able to be recruited normally within the lineage of origin. Happens K27M or K27M was there, it cannot spread the mark because within a given cell cycle, putting a dye then a trimethylation mark take time. And this enzyme is already slow and putting trimethylation is actually one of the slowest events. It takes a lot of time to put a trimethylation mark. So within a given cell cycle of a rapidly cycling progenitor, it cannot deposit enough k 27 me 3 It starts depositing the dye which spread, and then the tri which stays there and cannot spread beyond. So it's not a question of repulse, it's not a question of a stronger binding affinity, it's just a question of genetics and of spreading, at least this is what we think. And this is even further uh, uh, validated by the fact that we've evolved just because how hard and uh, it is to put the K27 trimethyl mark to have something that kicks off, that makes it go faster, which is EED. You need to reach a specific level of K27 ME3 and then the EED kicks and put it and spread it because you need, to, you need K27 ME3 to differentiate. Indeed, we uh, have an embryonic stem cell will have exactly like K27M their necessity for k 27 me 3 really sharp peaks and nothing more. Why? Because you want to have enough numbers of progenitor before you allow a given tissue to differentiate. And then to differentiate, you acquire the K27ME3, and this has been exquisitely shown, in order to go into neural differentiation, to get glial cells, oligodendrocytes, whatever you want, you need to deposit a large amount of k 27 me 3 and if you can't do it, you're stuck and you're stalled from differentiation. And what we think is happening is that PRC2, as I said, is able to come and to put the mark on very small areas of the genome on the initial landing site, but it cannot spread. It's the spread of the mark that's being affected and then you cannot differentiate. You're perpetually cycling in the same, same, same state, which led us to say 
this is the Peter Pan syndrome. Peter Pan is six year old or eight years old. He will never grow up. He doesn't want to grow up. And those cells cannot grow up because they have this mutation. They cannot differentiate and undergo terminal differentiation. And actually, the beauty came from the work of, uh, of Peter Lewis, and we, strong, we, we, we collaborated with him on this. We're looking at EZHIP that was identified by Marcel Kuhl as being highly expressed in posterior fossa group A ependymoma. The beauty of EZIP, of K27M, is that it mimics something that's present very early in development, where you don't want to have too much of uh, a PRC2 activity in order not to foster too, too much of a rapid differentiation. EZIP is expressed in the first trimester of gestation. It's expressed really in very limited number of cells and then, and we still are kind of trying to find what are those cells that it's expressed in, and it's never expressed after that. In PFA, it's get apparently expressed, and if you look at the chips of K27ME3, they look almost like identical to the K27M, and you have this restricted sharp peak of K27ME3. And when uh, uh, Peter looked at the sequence of, uh, uh, of uh, EZIP, there is 15 amino acids that are conserved across species. And those within those 15 amino acids is the K27M. And actually he showed that this is really the area that has this K27, the, the peptide area around K27M that makes the inhibitory peptide for EZH2. And K27M is just mimicking something that happened very early in development, where you're poisoning PRC2 and preventing it from mediating further differentiation. And if we looked at the ponds when those tumors arise, they are diagnosed already too late, like a black ponds. And actually, there are some stories from where a kid for trauma or something else was, disco we discovered something in the ponds at the age of 18 months that we follow, and it's only at five to six years that this becomes a tumor when it acquires other mutation. It's really small, these slowly those neuroprogenitors are multiplying, populating here, unable to differentiate and integrating there. If that's true, the moment you remove it, you should mediate differentiation. Brian Krog in my lab did this beautiful experiment where in the CRISPR line grown in stem cell media, we stained for GFAP, we mediated differentiation, we put the differentiation uh, media, whether it's uh, serum and other differentiation media. Look, if you have a K27M, you could barely differentiate and acquire GFAP. Look at the knockout cells that acquire GFAP. And more to that, when we put them in the brain of the mice, those knockout uh, edited clones versus the unedited clones, in three distinct cell lines, we had either a severe delay in tumor formation or almost no tumor formation in, in uh, this BT245, and this is true up to now. In this, we have very so delayed, and Susie Baker showed using SHRNA that you have a real delay in tumor formation when you knock, you decrease the amount of K27N. More to that, in the BT245, where we didn't see tumors in the, unedited, in the edited clones, we sacrificed the mice that were happily a year after injection, and 10% is human DNA. So those are actually, and we're doing single cell experiment to see into what they differentiated. Those are really tumors that, despite the fact that they had P53 and MYC, differentiated in C2 and were able to uh, not to form tumors anymore. So I told you that, you know, maybe something else replaces the intergenic K27 ME3. And this is also work done by Brian in collaboration with Steve Mack and Claudia Kleinman. Uh, and what we showed is that what seems to replace in uh, the intergenic K27ME3 and ME2 that's not being deposited based on K27M is lysine 27 acetylation. We have an increase in the acetylation uh, when you have the K27M mutation and K27 acetylation when it's pervasively deposited here in the intergenome induces the reawakening of the expression of the silent genome. And this include endogenous retroviruses. And maybe there's a level of uh, viral mimicry that's already present at baseline, as we showed, that we could push further by even more rendering barren this, uh, this uh, intergenome. DNA methylation is another way to silence the intergenome. And if you use DNA demethylating agents in combination with HDAC inhibitor to boost up even more the K27 acetylation, 
you have a more uh, immune prone setup. And then we showed that in mice, this promoted increased survival. And maybe this way we could prime them for immune checkpoint inhibitor and other immune therapy that are in there. So understanding what's happening in this intergenic region is something that's important. So we went even further than that. So just to kind of recap, because I'm, I'm saying a lot of notion, if you have uh, in the normal genome, you have your CGI that are pasted with K27ME3 and are usually, usually repressed. You have your intergenic regions that are also pasted with K27ME3 and repressed. And you have some CPGs where some specific genes that are pasted with K27ME3 and that are repressed. In the case of K27M, what can happen is that you have actually the body, you, you have a strong decrease in the K27ME3 and ME2 deposition, which get replaced either by K27Acetylation, but as I will show you, and we have data in a paper that's in revision now, lysine 36 dimethylation. And this actually is oncogenic, similar to the lack of spread of the K27ME3. One stalls differentiation, the other one may take advantage and render the cell more oncogenic and could be taken also for therapeutic manipulation because if we further increase ERV expression, we could make the tumor more hot to the immune system and potentially benefic beneficially use a checkpoint inhibitor to the advantage of patients. I work on Drosophila because we use any model that we could to try and, and mimic that. Show that I've been showing this slide forever, but we are more, this paper is finally in, in revision because we wanted to have more data as we went. When we use Drosophila Drosophila as a model and use different drivers to induce the expression of either K27M or K36M or histone 3.3 as a wild type control, what we saw is that we had similar phenotype for K27M and for K36M. When we use an eye driver, we had a hypotrophic eye. But more than that, when we looked more carefully and had more numbers, in K27 eyes, they were small, but they were rough, and there was overgrowth, almost like tumors already forming in. And when we put them in a notch background that's prime for tumor, they not only had tumors, but they had tumors that metastasized, and that was mainly for the K27M expressing eyes, and less so for the K36M expressing eyes. When we looked at how the cell polarity was done, and this is, we use F-actin. If you look here, you see the beautiful, how the eye in the Drosophila is a beautiful uh, uh, morphological composition, were really very, very uh, well-defined. Look how messed up it is in the K27M and seems less in the K36M. But more interestingly, there was actually transformation that was happening. Within the IDIS, we had expression of ANT and wingless, which are actually homeobox genes that, should, that are repressed, that are never expressed in the developing eye. And the wing is expressed usually in wingless and not in the IDIS. And what we could see is that we had wings in the eye cilia and so we had homeopathic transformation that were happening based on the k27m mutation why is that we went and looked at those marks that i was telling you about this is k27m this is k36m the lysine 27 dye as expected you see a decrease in the k27m uh, of the lysine uh, 27 dye and we see an increase in the k36m that we hadn't expected the same goes for K27ME3, a decrease in K27M that's expected because this is the effect on EZH2 of the K27M mutation and an increase in K36M. The reverse is true for the lysine 36 dye. We saw an increase in K27M almost as if the K36 dye was replacing the uh, K27 dye and try that weren't deposited in those eyes. Acetylation is harder, it's like a real mark. We, try, we tried doing that, we see some increase, but it's way harder to quantitate. I'm not saying it's only lysine 36 dye, but lysine 36 dye is part of the other mark that take advantage of the lots of intergenic K27 dye and try and, and spread over there and maybe oncogenic on their own. We looked at the transcriptome in those eye flies, uh, fly eyes, and we saw actually a decrease in genes that are associated with eye development, but with neural development and with Hox genes, and an increase 
upregulation in genes that are pi RNA, P with associated RNA. They're actually almost like your interference signature because those are the genes that when, that when your, your intergenome is unstable, rise up and, and create problems. And to show you, this is scrimped one of those uh, uh, PeeWee RNA, where in the K27M uh, setting, you have a decrease in the, the position of K27Tri by ChIP-seq, and you have a beautiful increase in the lysine 36 dye, which probably leads to its increased expression, as we see. And what we did is we did a modifier screen to see if we could push this phenotype one to, to the other. And we did a selective screen where we used his uh, epigenetic modifier of the CPG, so the PRC one and two complexes. If you use EZ, and EZ is uh, the mimic of EZH2 in Drosophila uh, uh, cross, if it is a K27M, it becomes lethal. It rescues the I in K36M. ASH1, which is a lidine 36 dimethyl transferase, rescue the K27M. And remember, I told you that you had an increase in, uh, the, uh, in, in the deposition of uh, lysine 20, uh, 36 dye in those eyes, while it renders the K36M, because already they were living on the bare necessity for lysine 36 dye, it rendered it even smaller. NSD and SET2, which are other lysine 36 dimethyl transferase, had no effect. And that speaks probably, we think that all those enzymes are equal in depositing those marks, the lysine 36 dye and whatever, they're not. In the head and neck cancer, it's only NSD1, NSD2 and NSD3, ASH1 and SET2. SETD2 were normally expressed and still we had a drastic decrease in the lysine 36 dye. It tells of a tissue specificity that really we need to account for. It's not, the same for everything, which makes it a little bit more complicated that to understand really what is it that's mediating the spread of the antagonistic mark in the given tissue that you're working with. So just to conclude on this part is understanding the fact that those mutations inhibit the set domain. This restricts to the position of the metal mark at that specific loci. So you live on the bare necessity for K27 ME3 and ME2 in K27M and of lysine 36 dye and try for K36M. You could push them forward. And I'll show you that. It's, what's happening here? So if you have, am I missing anything? No. So you have the K27, the effect on the mark, but then because you're, you're not depositing elsewhere in the genome, there's not good opportunity. So other marks come and take advantage, other antagonistic mark, K27 acetylation, K36 dimethylation in the context of K27M, and K27 ME2 and ME3 in the context of K36M. And those are equally oncogenic because they're mediating undue repression or undue activation of, your, uh, of genes in the epigenome. And you could work on that. You could remove the last pillars in K27M using EZH2 inhibitor. This is the idea of Christian Helen and I. Really, we have preliminary data that completely support. I know that Oren Becker's group hasn't found it, but this is something that I think is worth pursuing at many levels. You could act on the invading mark, which promote tumor genesis, either DNA demethylating agent and, and panabinostat, as Michel Manche was using for the panabinostat, to increase the level of viral mimicry and make the tumor more hot to the immune system. The K36ME2 inhibitors, those are not there yet, but those could be thought about because actually they go with recruiting DNA methylation and suppressing. So possibly for now, we could work with the DNA demethylating agent for that. So just not, don't think on the effect of the mark uh, on the mark, but also it's not in, it, it's all in uh, combined together. It's what's also antagonistic and how they spread. And this interplay needs to be taken all together in order to really make push forward. So I can see further trial using EZH2 inhibitor and potentially DNA demethylating agent or others, so our FDA approved. One last thing, I'll take two minutes and I'll go fast because this is published, but I think this is 
something that's very keen to my heart. I think there is a common theme across all of those pediatric tumors that are high grade, either the embryonal ones or those gliomas that we high grade glioma that we study, which is stall development. And this is the title of our paper that was published last year in Nature Genetics, Stall Development Program at the Root of Pediatric Brain Tumor. And this was co-led by Claudia Kleinman and by a beautiful student in her lab, Celine Jessa, in collaboration with people in my lab. And in collaboration with Michael Taylor, who's a dear friend and collaborator, this is something that was, was really, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun and it's going forward. So what we have been putting, we discovered this fusion in ETMRs in embryonal tumors, multi-red multi layered rosettes, that actually reawakens the C19MC cluster of microRNAs and a DNMT3B that's really exquisitely specific to the fetal brain. It's a developmental program that's only present between eight and 12 weeks of this gestation that's reawakened by this fusion. And we think it's really stalled there. The ATRT is so early, the same goes here. Wind medulloblastoma, the same thing. And the high-grade glioma, based on the oncogenic mechanism that I'm telling you about. Really, a narrow window of opportunity that's permissive to the development of those tumor. If we put those mutations too early or too late, either they're lethal or they don't do anything, which just tells me that there are really a narrow window that's permissive to their effect. And this is important because this narrow window doesn't exist anymore in the patient that has it. So if we could target it, the rest of the brain will not suffer from it. So we need to understand it. So what we did is we compiled like almost a blueprint of the developing brain, the hind brain, the forebrain, a different time point, whether it's through our own data set or through multiple different data sets that we acquired from, from the literature and we're still acquiring because this is something that's quite uh, quite go going on, ongoing now. And we use single cell RNA-seq, both sequencing, and we projected. And what we did, the other thing that we did is we also used, oh, I, that slide was removed, the transcriptome uh, and sing single cell attack seq that we have here to just identify what are the area and what are the transcription factors that are driving this set or that set during development. And what we saw is that the forebrain is dominated by neurogenesis and a large pr proportion of progenitors. The pons is very large. The progenitors are unique, and it's really made of glial expansion. I think the, the pons and the hindbrain are much less studied and should be further studied, and this is something that we're doing as we go. And we could infer prosotime, look at lineages. This is the slide that I was looking for. Look at transcription factor, core transcription factor, to as assign a cell of origin or a lineage of origin based on what they expressed over there. And this helped us actually show uh, the group of, uh, of uh, Richard Gilbertson in 2010 had published a beautiful paper that was really highly commented in 2010, where they inferred that uh, the wind medoblastoma didn't come from the cerebellum. Medoblastoma thought to be cerebellar tumor, and they actually thought that they were coming from the lower rhombic limb and from mossy fibers or other, uh, other cells. Our analysis helped us actually we find that they are actually coming from mossy fiber neurons and not from the auditory nuclei or climbing other neurons. So we helped refine this and he had already put it forward. In ETMRs, we saw that they're really recapitulating the brain. They're cycling within this, almost trying as progenitor to recapitulate a full brain. We could never find anything for ATRTs. So either we need to go outside of neuro, the neuroectoderm to the mesoderm, or we, could, we need to go to earlier time point, because this is something that we couldn't make uh, for, for this. And those tumors may, may actually have an effect even earlier than E6.5 in mice. So I think there is a common theme that's coming. Those oncohistone, those are mimicking development, things that poise development. And what our single cell data is indicating that it's development that stuck and gone wrong. Only a few cells, but what damage they are creating. And they're stuck in development. If we can understand how to really unblock them, we could promote terminal differentiation. And this may be a good way of treating them instead of the radiation therapy that are life-saving, but we all know what are the side effects that they bring, and sometimes they're not enough. Oftentimes they're not enough. 
or the different chemotherapeutic agents that also are as debilitating but are needed, unfortunately, until we, we know better. This work could never have been done without the multiple collaborators across the world that shared expertise, samples, and data sets. The people in my lab that I try to acknowledge that make me smile every day, they're amazing people that are doing the work and they should get the benefit. It's, it's impressive to see young people so committed and so hardworking. The amazing collaboration that I have with Claudia Kleinman's group and her, her lab. It's really a love story like the one that I have with Jacek. Uh, I have different uh, husband and wife that are professional husband and wife. Michael, who is a dear friend and collaborator, really a beautiful uh, collaboration here, and different people at St. Justine that are providing samples and expertise as we go. And thank you very much. Thank you, Nada. Um, that was amazing and such passion for what you do. So we appreciate it. Um, we have some questions that are coming in, so we're going to jump right into those if you're, if you're ready to keep going for a few minutes. I have, I'm sorry I went longer, but that's my problem. I, I want to say more. No, but are you okay to do a few questions? Go ahead. Okay. First question comes from, um, let's see, Jaldeep, and the question is, which one is responsible for inhibition of gliogenesis as well as neurogenesis, K36M or K27M? So K36M, we don't see it's inhibiting. We never see K36. There is one tumor that has in the spine K36M. We think that K36M is not viable in the brain if it happens because those lines are very hard to get. So it's K27M that's, uh, that's really there. It's, it's quite intriguing, even though in the Rosophila they seem to hone in on the same phenotype. It's, uh, they, you never see K36M mutation in the brain. It's the K27M that's involved in that. They have the same effect through different way. They, it's actually, I think the common theme is reorienting PRC1, either through dilution or just it's, it cannot go elsewhere because there is not enough of its target because they are just there. Uh, another comment came in that said, wonderfully clear presentation, thank you. And then um, Jerome. Jerome Fortin. Yeah. Beautiful work. I love the Drosophila experiments. I recently observed in CRISPR screens that set D2 was a fitness gene in some DIPG cells. I was wondering why, and I think you provided the answer. Have you tested whether perturbing K36 methylation is deleterious for K27 in mutant cell lines? So yes, we did. This is, uh, I went very fast on it. We did uh, the screen. When we, uh, there's no inhibitors that are present. I'm trying, I'm following very closely the literature. So there, so we did the RNAi screens and the uh, only, uh, so there are multiple uh, enzymes that deposit lightning 36 dye. Uh, ASH1 is the only one that had uh, a rescue. So, and we showed that it decreased the level of lightning 36 dye. In, uh, in the fly, uh, in the K27M fly, and it rescued the phenotype. And it's very intriguing, as I said, that SET, which is another enzyme that could mediate the lightning 36 dye, or NSZ, like NSZ1 and 2 in the fly, couldn't do it. But I really think that in specific specialized tissue, their effect is non redundant, or they may base different areas of the genome based on where they're recruited. And in, in the eye of the fly, it's uh, ASH1. And actually, Ash1 uh, new mutants in humans have eye defects. Okay, two more questions. Um, when you did your RNA seq, did you pick up any genetic mutations? When when I did my RNA screen, did I? Uh, I didn't. Uh, we didn't pick any genetic mutation. No, we didn't. Okay. The next one says, "Great talk. Um, why are H3?" Point three K twenty seven M mutations more common than H three point one K twenty seven mutations, even I though love this. even though there are many copies of H three point one genes in the genome. I, there's even more to that. If you look in H three point one, there are thirteen genes, fifteen genes at H three point one, and there's only two, one more than the other, which is one three B, and that's highly mutated. And I, we looked at expression. I think it depends on the expression. If you look at the developing brain. Histone 3.3 is really actively replating. You, you, there's a lot of growing in the developing brain. And histone 3.3 is, uh, 
is quite needed and mandated and your U comet is way more based with histone 3.3 than it should be normally. And I think it's a question of uh, effect that, that you need and intensity of effect. I'm not answering completely that question. There seem to be uh, a window that's more favorable for H3.1, uh, which is uh, in earlier children, doesn't mean that it's an earlier uh, stage, but this is those are things that we're trying to look at. We looked also at the sequence. Sometimes you need uh, you need it for H why not H3X3A and not H3X3B. For H3X3B, you need to mutate two nucleotides to get a K27M. So the likelihood of this happening becomes way lower. So that's why it's mainly H3X3A, I think. Uh, and there are some of the histone 3.1 genes where it's not, but there is, we, we're really trying, one of the dirty answers, as I said, is that because H3.3 is so much more important during brain development and is actively replacing H3.1, so it's more of an opportunity at that time. Another question just came in, in uh, from Jeffrey Allen. How do you account for these embryonal tumors arising in older children or adults? Because they take their time. Because what we think is taking is just there, has been there forever. Remember with the black ponds, they only become, it's only when they reach, like they, they can, they get too much of the size in the ponds that you can get that. And if you look even in the K27M that are in adult thalamic tumors, it's below the age of 50. So I'm not saying that 50 is young, but I think really it's just, it's something that arose and I think more studies are needed just to see if the same lineage, the same cell, but it seems to be. It just, it's a time needed to acquire that other event that they will undoubtedly acquire that will trigger the symptoms and the discovery of the mutation. Well, that brings us to the end of our questions. I feel like that was rapid fire questions and um... Not a, we appreciate it. We appreciate you coming on and doing this lecture. We appreciate everything that you do to help kids with cancer and hope that you stay safe and continue to do well up there in, in Canada. Thank you very much. I really love your, your foundation. This is something, it's a love story for me and uh, what you're doing is very valuable. You're keeping the morale because it's not easy to be isolated like we all are and uh, listening to science is probably what's keeping me sane and uh, doing science and trying to, to help. I'm also a practicing physician, just trying to, beyond COVID, there are a lot of things that needs to be uh, to be done. And you know what, uh, this K27M, we discovered it in 2012. I still remember to the day, uh, Carolyn Freeman, who is a mentor and Jeffrey Allen knows her very well, looked at me and said, oh my God, it's, it's awful. I said, why, we know. He said, no, it's gonna take you way more than you think to be able to uncover. And I, uh, she was right about this, but I want really this to, to, to end. And a lot of groups are working at different ways of tackling it. And I'm very happy that within the next few years, we'll be able to provide those kids with something. And thank you very much for your efforts. We look forward to it. And then one more comment just came in and said, thank you for your inspiring talk. Thank so you I'll very leave much. You with that. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. Bye. Bye.